I'm very honored to be here tonight again. Uh, it's lovely to be in the house where I spent so many years um, and seeing um, Neville preaching the gospel. And um, um, I'm happy that I can share the gospel with you tonight. It, it, that is the thing that I want to do with my life. And I hope that I will inspire you to do the same. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. And uh, that is the message of uh, my life, I think. <laughs> Getting people active into the kingdom. Preaching the gospel. Laying hands on the sick. And seeing the work of the Holy Spirit on the earth. But before we go on, let us pray. And let's just Welcome the Holy Spirit who's already here. Let's welcome him to do what he wants to do tonight. Lord Jesus, we honor you tonight. We give you our lives. We give you our resources. We give you our time. We give you our dreams, Lord. Lord, we want to come and place everything we are, everything we have. We want to place it on the altar, Lord. We want to give to you as you've given to us. Holy Spirit, we honor you in this place and we realize that we are dependent on you 100%. Lord, you've sent us into this world to change it. You've sent us into this world to bring fires into the hearts of those that has gone dead. Fires into the hearts of those that has never seen you, felt you, or heard about you. Lord, I pray tonight that you will come, Holy Spirit, and touch the hearts of every person listening, online and in this church, that we will not leave this church and this service unchanged. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will come and give us new hearts for those that are, that are backslidden, Lord, for those that has gone cold, those that, are, that has removed themselves from you. Tonight, Lord, I pray that they will move close again. Holy Spirit, draw them in again and show them the love that you have for them. Jesus, you love us so much. You love us so much. And because of your love, Lord, we will go to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I think a lot of people are a bit absent uh, in the spirit, if, if you want to put it that way. We've seen a, a little bit of a, a bit of a people being distancing themselves from being active in the spirit. I don't want to use the word backsliding because it, it's a bit negative though, but there's a bit of a falling away at this point in time. People not used to being by themselves they, they don't have the self-discipline yet to be in the Word, to be on their knees. They don't have the support structures around them, and people fall away. And at this point in time, we look at this and we ask ourselves, what is the depth of spirituality of the church today? Where do we find ourselves when we organize a prophetic meeting, everybody's there? When we organize a healing meeting, everybody's there, but when we pray, only a few pictures up. And what, what does it say about us? And I pray in this time, we've prophesied about the revival that will come. I pray in this time that hearts will awaken and people will truly find Jesus and truly believe him, trust in him, be in the word. I pray that people will stand up and realize that they are a revival themselves, that they, they can do everything they've seen the biggest spiritual giants in history do. That is the reality that I want you to realize tonight, is that the Holy Spirit in you can use you mightily. You can go further than you've ever dreamt if you only let him work through you. The title of tonight is Fire on the Mountain. And as I work through a bunch of scriptures and stuff that I'll read um, to you tonight, you'll see what I mean by fire on the mountain, that eventually that is you. And we need the fire of Jesus. The question maybe, and as I am still on the same topic is, I want to bring you to remembrance. I want you to remember all the things that you've been taught over the years, all the people that have that is sweat blood for you, people that has labored over you, Families that has prayed for you to receive Jesus. 
all the work that has been, uh, been invested in you, all the time that you've put in studying the word, all the time that you've spent on your knees, every teaching that you've ever listened to, all of everything, all of those things, I need you to remember that. And the time for you to use it is now. The time for you to move forward and say, I am a son of God. I have the Holy, Holy Spirit inside of me. I function in the power of God. That time for you to, the time is now. The time for you to stand up is now. It's not one day, it's not Sunday, it is now. The thing is, you need to decide what will you do with the power that is given you. Have you ever asked yourself, why has he given you immense power? If you are saved, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, if you've, if you've said yes to Jesus, if you've laid down your life, he has given you the Holy Spirit. He's given you the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. And I want to remind you tonight, now is the time to stand up. In our country, in, in this country, we need you. The people need you. The lost, they need you. You are the mouthpiece of God in this country. I was so much inspired in the past week reading a little booklet of Charles Finney. For some of you that do not know who he is, uh, who he was, um, actually, he was born in 17, um, 1792, and he died in 1875. So give or take 250 years back, 230 years back, he lived on the earth. And he was a sort of a catalyst and an inspiration that brought about a few mass evangelists on the earth, like D.L. Moody, Billy Sunday, Billy Graham, a bunch of guys truly inspired by the works of Finney. Some, for, uh, some people spoke of him as the father of modern revi um, revivalism. So Finney was a, a preacher of the gospel. He was an evangelist. He was a revivalist with fire in his spirit. He made a mark in history by preaching the gospel as he did. And I want to read you a little piece, just the introduction of one page, as, as he wrote in this book. Now, this is a compilation of some of his messages he preached at the revivals where he preached. It starts, uh, the heading says, how to begin a revival. It says, a revival is nothing else than a new beginning of obedience to God. Just as in the case of a converted sinner, the first step is a deep repentance, a breaking down of heart, a getting down in the dust before God with deep humility and a forsaking of sin. An individual once in, went into a factory to see the machinery. This was Mr. Finney himself. His mind was solemn as he had leaned as he had been where there was a revival. The people who labored there all knew him by sight and knew who he was. A young lady who was at, at work saw him and whispered some foolish remark to a companion and laughed. The person stopped and looked at her with a feeling of grief. She stopped. Her thread broke. It seems like she was working with a machine making clothes or something. Her thread broke. And then she was so much agitated that she could not join it. She looked out at the window to compose herself and then tried again. Again and again, she strove to recover her self-command. At length, she sat down, overcome by her feelings. The person then approached and spoke with her. She soon manifested a deep sense of sin. The feelings spread through the establishment like fire. And in a few hours, almost every person employed there was under the conviction. So much that the owner, though a worldly man, was astounded and requested to have the works stopped and a prayer meeting held. For he said, it was a great deal more important to have these people converted than to have the works go on. And in a few days, the owner and nearly all the persons employed in the establishment, about 3,000, were hopefully converted. The eye of this individual, his solemn countenance, 
His compassionate feeling rebuked the levity of the young woman and brought her under conviction of sin. And probably in a great measure, this whole revival followed from so small an incident. This was a man that walked in the holiness of God. And just looking at this man, you were convicted of sin. There was something that happened to this lady as she said something foolish about the man of God. But the Holy Spirit touched her, and there was a conviction as he spoke to her. A whole factory of 3,000 people got saved because of a lady looking at him and saying something. Can it be that you and I can be filled with the fire of God so much that we walk in revival constantly, that when somebody looks at you, something happens in their spirit? Is it possible that you and I can walk like Finney into areas, preach the gospel, so that thousands can be saved? I mean, he didn't even preach in this instance. What will it take for you to change your mind concerning the lost? What will it take for you to lay down your life and realize at the end of your life, everything you've done, every cent you've made, means nothing on this earth. It means nothing. The souls around you need that, that what, which is inside of you, more precious than gold. Just like Finney, or just like Elijah, I believe, Finney was sent. Not one of these men were sent to comfort. They were more sent to confront. We are in a time where we where you and I, where Christians do not confront the sin of this world. We are too scared to mention it on our lips. Not one of these revivalists of old feared man. Maybe this was the most single, the thing that made them, the, 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 most, the single factor that made them successful was the fact that they did not fear man. They spoke about sin because sin exists, and sin draws us away from God. Sin comes between you and God. And if you do not deal with your sin, you will suffer the consequences. Jesus died for your sins. He paid for you, yes. He made sure that you will enter into eternity with him. But now, here on the ground, you still need to make a choice between sin and righteousness. That's why these guys hammered on this one factor, that sin needs to be eradicated. Repentance is key in revival. I was driving in my car last week, listening to all the negative stuff going on. You can't put the radio on without hearing something disastrous going on in our city, in our country. And I just heard these words in my spirit, when will we cry for a city? When will we truly cry for the lost? When will we truly break our hearts for what breaks is? When will we be on our knees and feel the pain of this city? You live here. You have an influence in this city. But what are you doing to change it? When will we cry for this city? Elijah made a sudden appearance with undaunted courage and a fiery zeal. He was used by God to destroy the evil worship of Baal and later destroyed Jezebel as well. Now, Israel had a long history of evil and wicked kings and God used these prophets, he used them as an interface, as a conductor of heaven. He used them to bring the message of God, the heart of God, to these kings. They hated the prophets because the prophets condemned the sin. The prophets did not keep their mouths shut to the things that they saw happening in government with the king. And so Elijah was sent to Ahab. 
Now, Ahab and his wife Jezebel, they were evil. They were worshippers of Baal and other gods. And Baal was often depicted in the form of a bull because the bull, repre- or the bull represents fertility and strength. But the bull was also the god that they prayed to for rain and plentiful harvest. So Jezebel and Ahab, as they worshipped Baal of the harvest, of the rain, God sends Elijah out of the desert, out of nowhere, a Tishbite, and he sends him into the throne room of the king, of King Ahab. King Ahab, a mighty kingdom, a mighty army, sitting there probably in splendor, and this dusty old prophet walking in, maybe not old, but this dust, dusty prophet walking in there with the power of God on him and a message in his heart from God. He looks at Ahab and he gives him what God says. Now listen to um, the first chapter, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishba in Gilead said to Ahab, as, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. So he tells the king, there will be no rain, no more. It stops now. And it will only rain again by my word. So Elijah leaves and he sort of flees and he goes and hides in a brook uh, or close to a brook away from the king, away from the kingdom. And ravens feed him. And the, as the water runs out, he again flees up to the widow with his son. And you remember the, the miracle of the flower and the food never running out. And also the son dying, the widow's son dying, and him stretching himself out on the son, uh, bringing him back from the dead. And then after three years, God spoke to him again, sending him back. And if we look in, let me quickly go there, in chapter 18, from verse 17. Almost there. Sorry. Verse 1, just again, it says, After many days the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourselves to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So it, the whole chapter goes on, and he eventually gets to, um, to Ahab. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house. Because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Elijah, now you can imagine, is a man wanted. In the meantime, King Ahab sent out his troops to look for Elijah. They wanted to kill him. They looked everywhere. Because he dropped a word in the, in the palace and he ran off and the rain never came back. So they were looking for him. They were angry. They wanted to kill him. But Elijah was sent by God again. So now at this point, Elijah goes up to the mountain and he challenges these bold prophets by saying to them, build an altar, put, choose a bull, put it on there, and then we pray. And the God... And then Elijah would do the same. And then he says, the God who will come down with fire is the true God of Israel. Now you can imagine if that doesn't happen, Elijah's dead again. This is a man who placed his life on the line, who put his feet at, put his life at the feet of God, really in total surrender. And throughout the book, or throughout the few chapters where Elijah, with the account of Elijah, as you can see that he's scared like you and I, full of emotions, scared to die, but he was obedient all the way through. Verse 36, And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, 
and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. He was willing to give up His life so that the people might see God again. As I was driving last week in the northern part of Pretoria at night, I saw this fire on the mountain burning. And it just reminded me of Elijah and the fire. But the thing about that fire is that that you can see it a long way off. Maybe as far as the eye can see, you will see the fire on the mountain. You see, when the revival, when God, when God kicks in, when God decides to bring a revival, you will see the fire. You will truly know that God, with His power and His fire, has arrived. There's no doubt about that. But the thing is, When I speak about revival, and maybe tonight is not really, this message is not really about revival. I struggled to really package what I want to say. Because it's really about what's going on in your heart. In this generation, somebody else will do it. There's this thinking and there's this attitude that somebody else will save the lost. Somebody else will teach them. Somebody else will bring revival. If that is our attitude, I doubt if we will ever see it. Most of the revivalists in history, most of them were men people never knew. And all of a sudden, things just happened because of obedience. And because God likes choosing the nobodies, the foolish, the fishermen. He likes choosing those that has not been influenced by religion, that's not been filled with pride, those that has been been groomed in behind the stages, behind doors, in rooms, on their knees. Isaiah 10 verse 12. Again, this prophet was called to bring judgment in, in chapter 10. And he says... I said, plant the good seeds of righteousness and you will harvest a crop of love. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts for now is the time to seek the Lord that he may come and shower righteousness upon you. That is verse 12. Verse 1 it says, How prosperous Israel is, a luxuriant vine loaded with fruit, but the richer the people get, the more pagan altars they build, the more bountiful their harvests, the more beautiful their sacred pillars. The hearts of the people are fickle. They are guilty and must be punished. The Lord will break down the altars and smash their sacred pillars. Then they will say, we have no king because we didn't fear the Lord. But even if we had a king, what could he do for us anyway? They spout empty words and they make covenants they don't intend to keep. So injustice springs up among them like poisonous weeds in a farmer's field. Today, in this country, we have come to a place where sin abounds, godlessness. It is funny how you do not hear this being preached. Our leaders are corrupt, most of them. Our churches are silent on most of the sin in our country. And God, throughout history, has sent prophets to the nation of Israel, warning them that there's consequences to sin. That if you do not repent, this is what will happen. But unlike Elijah, it seems like Isaiah has got a little bit of a soft tone by saying to him, plant 
saying to Israel, plant the good seeds of righteousness and you will harvest a crop of love. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts for now is the time to seek the Lord that he may come. Do you see our hearts and even in this time as I started off tonight is that our hearts might look like a, a land that was plowed, they was harvested, they plowed, and it, it was left. And it is dead. There's nothing growing. There's no crops growing. There's no fruits. And he uses this picture by saying, plow up the hard ground of your hearts, for now is the time to seek the Lord that he may be found. And if that is you tonight, if your heart it's like that hard ground. Let the Holy Spirit come and plow it up. If it is sin that has caused you to be quiet and still, let the Holy Spirit come in as you repent and ask the Lord for forgiveness and for new life. Paul says in Galatians 6, 8, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. And throughout this COVID time and all the pandemics and the wars and all the sickness and, and everything that is to come on this earth, because we are on the earth, are you ready for what is coming? Will you be able to not give up? Do not grow weary. Do not grow weary of doing good. For in due season you will reap if we do not give up. God is looking at our hearts and God is waiting for us to step out and bring that which he has placed in us. Over the years, it needs to come forth now. I want to read you a quick, I want to read you something that I wrote this week, which I feel is really fitting to read now. Um, let me just see. Sorry, I've lost it. I want to inspire you also to really go and read some of the old men that brought revivals to the earth. There's something about them that will stir faith inside of you. I was stirred after reading a part of this book and I wrote this little piece. I, I called it Firefighter. Most fires burn and rage until their fuel sources are depleted. But there is one fire that will not stop burning for eternity. Jesus said it this way in Mark 9, 47. To be cast into hell fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Charles Finney said the church ought to put out the fires of hell which are laying hold of the wicked. The alarm has been going off in the fire station, but the firemen are fast asleep a spirit of slumber, an occupation with death. The water pipelines have been shut, the fire trucks have been dismantled, and the firemen have forgotten their duty. Jesus, more than any other person in the Bible, spoke about hell. He spoke more about hell than heaven. Was he a doom's prophet? Was he a negative preacher, as some would deem it in our day? No, he was the answer, the water to put out the fire the first firefighter. We are called as firemen, fighting the raging fires of hell, licking up those praying with it, playing with it, sin. Jesus cried out in John 7, 38, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You have access to unmeasurable oceans of water, the answer to eternal love, peace, and joy. Jesus Christ, you are a firefighter. 
a mighty flowing river. Can you see the fires? Can you feel the heat? And I want to say to you now, if you cannot feel the heat, if you cannot see what's going on, you are blind. And further on, God calls you to put out fires. He's calling you for your sister, for your brother, for your mother, for your friends, for those that's far off. He's calling you to put out the fires in their lives. You have the answer. You have the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Yet there is no more excuse for us. In this time that we find ourselves now, there's no more time for playing. Us, the church, there's no more time to play. That's the message of my heart. That is what we need to do now, is every single believer need to step out and give Christ to the people around them. Your workplace, what can you do? Have you considered in discipling a person? So many questions, so many opportunities. Such a powerful Holy Spirit in you. Last scripture that I want to read to you tonight. Matthew 5, 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Last night, late afternoon, when I started putting this together or looking at what you say this afternoon or tonight, I didn't tell my wife what I was going to speak about. And she had a dream last night, a really long one. But at the end of this dream, being in a church where the Holy Spirit started falling, the Lord showed her that there's some people in the church who are conductors, good conductors, geleiers of the Holy Spirit. And in the dream, it was those people that usually burst out in tongues, those people that usually jump up and down, they're a bit crazy, but she saw it was those type of people, and God showed her that these people are good conductors of revival. And then she, she saw another group of people in the church, and it was people that was busy pulling down revival from heaven to earth by the desire of that they had inside of them. Do you have a desire to see the fire of God fall on the church? Do you have a desire to see the fire of God in our government? Do you have the desire to see masses and masses of our people falling on their faces like these people fell on their faces when they saw the fire of God consume the altar because God showed up God showed that he's almighty, that he's powerful, and the Baal prophets could not. Ahab could not. But the people saw it with their eyes, like when a revival comes, it will be a fire on a mountain. The people will not be able to deny that God is God, that he's the Lord. But the thing is, it is inside of you. It is inside of you tonight. You need to real realize that revival starts with you, not me meaning the pastor, the preacher. It starts with you. You are a catalyst. You are a conductor. You are a witness. You are an ambassador of the kingdom. You are the interface between heaven and earth. A physical being filled with God, which is spirit. You have the ability to bring heaven to earth because that is what revival is is when the atmosphere and the culture of heaven penetrates this earth and the hearts of men here. When that happens, you will see fire. And it will be like a fire on a mountain. And may you be a fire. May you be the fire. May you be a history maker. May you be inspired tonight. May you believe that this is the truth. 
Change your mind about what you say about yourself. Change what you think about your abilities. Stop looking at your past. Stop living in the past. Stop living in the future, fighting for success. Live now. Release the fire that is in you. It is there. It just needs to flow. It is a river. Let's close our eyes. Lord Jesus, the cry of my heart tonight is that you will come and ignite a fresh fire in each person's heart that watches or listens to this sermon. For each person sitting here tonight, Lord, I ask you, Lord, that as they desire it, that you will come and ignite a new fire in their spirits, Lord. I pray that they will not be the same. I trust you and I believe in you. And I've tr I know, Lord, that when any person says, yes, I want more of you, that you will come. You will come. You will come, Lord, and change that heart. Lord, we call for fire of revival in our government. We call for the fire of revival in our police. We call for fire in our schools, Lord, in the churches, Father. Lord Jesus, we call for the fire in the children's hearts, in the pastors, in the leaders of society, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that we will see revival. And for each brother of mine and each sister that says yes, that is willing to walk the walk, that is willing to become one with his spirit, let us do it together. Let us stand together for what is right. Let us stand up for his kingdom, for his sake. Let our lives be laid down at his feet. Let him use us to the death. As the Father has sent him, Jesus, so he sends us to our cross. In Jesus' name, amen.